checkering on a gun stock is both functional and attractive, and it takes lots of time and patience. Let me show you this interesting process. Checkering's main function is to help securely hold the gun. At the same time, it should be attractive, like on this variety of sporting rifles. A Winchester Model 70 standard and super grade. A Wesley Richards takedown and a Griffin and Howe Sporter. The style of the checkering pattern is a matter of personal preference. And personally, I prefer a pistol grip pattern similar to the one on this standard grade Model 70. It's a simple two panel design rather than a wraparound design that goes over the top. I like a gentle curve on the back of the panels. A margin at the bottom and the overall length of the panels to be about like this. The curve on the back of this super grade model 70 pattern is too straight for my preference. The Wesley Richards is even straighter. While the Griffin Howe has a nice gentle curve, which suits me best. I like the margin on the Griffin Howe, which is about an eighth of an inch. The Wesley Richards has no margin as the checkering goes all the way to the grip cap. The Model 70 Supergrade has a very generous margin at three eighths of an inch, while the standard Model 70 has about a quarter of an inch. The overall length of the grip panels is about four inches on both Model 70s. The Wesley Richards is about five inches and the Griffin and Howe is about six. For the four end pattern, I've decided that one similar to this pre-64 Model 70 Supergrade is most pleasing to my eye. The standard grade Model 70 has a two panel design while the Wesley Richards and Griffin Howe both have wraparound patterns. I like the margin on the forend to be the same as the bottom of the pistol grip, which is about an eighth of an inch, like on this Griffin and Howe Sporter. For me, the pattern should start at the front edge of the receiver ring and end about an inch behind the forend tip. This will give a pattern about six inches long. The forend checkering on the standard grade Model 70 goes from the receiver ring to the front swivel. The Model 70 Supergrade starts a bit farther back and extends to the front swivel. The Wesley Richards has a very short pattern. While the Griffin Howe goes from behind the receiver ring almost to the fore end tip. Before I can begin the actual process of checkering, I need a way to hold the stock. The most efficient way to do that is to use a checkering cradle. It holds the stock securely while allowing it to be rotated. Now before beginning the checkering, the finish should be completely cured. I like to wait at least a couple weeks after the last coat of finish is applied to let the finish harden up. The process of checkering requires just a few specialized tools. The first step is to locate the panels on the pistol grip. I begin by drawing a center line along the top and bottom of the pistol grip with a fine marker. This will help me keep both grip panels symmetrical. The first line on the panel is the bottom of the grip. I draw this line in about 3 16 of an inch up from the edge, which will give me a 1 8 inch margin after I cut the border. Next, I'll mark where the points of the pattern will be located.
The front edge of the panel is drawn in using the center line as a guide. Then the back edge of the panel is marked, maintaining a fairly even width of the panel from top to bottom. I've moved the back edge just a bit to keep the pattern even. If I'm not happy, I can simply wipe everything off and start over. But this looks pretty good. Once I'm satisfied with the shape, I'll draw a matching panel on the other side. I look both panels over carefully along the top and bottom center lines of the grip to make sure they closely match. Using a layout guide, I can scribe the bottom edge of each panel. I'll cut the back line with a 60 degree single line cutter. This tool has a steep angle and allows for greater control as I create a very thin line. The front border line is next. followed by the other panel. The last part of laying out the grip panels are the master lines, or guidelines, laid out so the diamonds will run slightly uphill. I'm using the three to one portion of the checkering guide to create diamonds that will be three times as long as they are wide. I may have to add a little extra checkering here to fill in this space. The master lines are now scribed in to ensure the lines are perfectly straight. I'm using a piece of flexible plastic strapping as a straight edge. Then I'll cut them in with the 60 degree single line cutter. And repeat the process for the other side. Since the last sanding was with 600 grit paper, I'll remove the marker lines with a small piece of sandpaper and mineral spirits. The first step in checkering is to deepen the border and master lines to about two thirds of their final depth. I'm gonna checker this stock at 20 lines per inch using a spacing tool with a 20 line per inch spacing. The smooth portion follows the master line without deepening it, while the cutting portion cuts a new line 50 thousandths of an inch from the master line. I'm using very light pressure and short back and forth strokes. After making one pass, I'll chase out the line, deepening it slightly. The cutter cuts only on the push stroke. The cutting tool is now moved one line to the left and the process is repeated. After about five lines, I reverse the vise and finish up the beginning of the lines. Then switch to a spacer that spaces from left to right and finish the very ends of the line with a single line cutter. Extending the lines to the border requires extra patience but since I've cut the border to about two thirds final depth, I can run the cutter right up to the edge and bump it without running over. Although the lines look crooked since they follow the curves along the pistol grip, another method when reaching the border is to reverse a cutter in the handle so it cuts on the pull stroke 
and use a technique called hook and pull. The tool is placed against the border and pulled back, which prevents cutting past the line. Extra care must be taken in the corners. The lines are short and the spacer is used just to mark them. An X-Acto knife can be used to draw in the last line. Then a short cutter is used for deepening, except for the very shortest lines. These are deepened with a veiner. It's a small V chisel, perfect for this specific job. It's important to have a good light source, but not too bright. Keeping the light at an angle off to the side makes the lines much easier to see and follow. Before I lay out the remaining lines, I'd like to fill in this area. It will give a better overall look to the pattern to add another point right where the master lines cross. Extending about nine lines will fill in the void. This will make it a three point pattern rather than two. I'll stop just short of the marker line. When the lines are cut in the other direction, I'll connect them. When cutting short lines, it's very important to make sure they stay parallel. I'll draw in a series of progress lines. As I continue with the checkering, these will be a guide to help keep my lines parallel. These progress marks or lines can be used anywhere and beginners may want to utilize them all the time. Here you can see how they work. This is a good example of finishing a corner with a veiner. Once the lines are finished in one direction, the crossing lines are cut. I begin by chasing out the master lines before starting on the rest. Now that the middle point is complete, I can turn the stock around and finish these lines. Then it's just a matter of cutting lines until they are all laid out. Again, when I get close to the edge of the pattern, I can use the hook and pull technique to keep from running over. The diamonds are now all well defined, but the tops are still flat. The hardest part of checkering is completed. I'll start the first of three deepenings of the lines. 
The first deepening is done with a 60 degree cutter. I normally make two passes on each deepening. The first one is very light and the second with a little more pressure. The front of the cutter bumps up against the border to prevent a runover. You can see how the first pass begins to deepen the checkering. Once all the lines are deepened in one direction, I'll deepen the crossing lines. It's important to keep the cutter perpendicular to the work to keep the lines consistent. This is what it looks like after the first deepening with the 60 degree cutter. Now I'll switch to the 90 degree cutter. Again, I'll make two passes, a light one followed by a second with a little more pressure. The first pass in one direction with the 90 degree cutter really begins to define the diamonds. Next, I'll deepen the crossing lines. As I check her close to the border, I have to deepen it slightly with the 60 degree cutter to keep from running over. After a pass in both directions with the 90 degree cutter, some of the diamonds still have tiny flats on top. One last deepening with the 90 degree cutter will take care of those. After the last pass, a light cleanup will ensure that all the diamonds are the same depth. Anyone looking at the checkering will not be able to tell which direction the last pass was made. Once all the lines have been cleaned up, the border is next. I'll use a border tool for this. It cuts a rounded edge along the outside of the pattern. It's cut to the right depth when all of the finish has been removed. As I reach the point, each border line is extended with the 60 degree single line cutter until they meet. To finish the corner, I'll use a pocket knife to round off what can't be reached with the border tool. Brushing out the checkering removes the sawdust. A stiff nylon brush works great. The last step is to seal the checkering. I'm using Miles Gilbert stock sealer and simply brush it into the diamonds. This protects the wood and helps prevent moisture from entering the stock. Any excess is wiped off with a paper towel. Although it's a bit shiny, the sealer will dry to a satin finish. I've decided that a four end panel, similar to the one on this Winchester Model 70 Supergrade, is about what I'm looking for. The four end panel should be large enough to give a good grip when the hand is in the shooting position, but not so long that it looks overdone. 
This pattern will start at the front edge of the receiver ring and end about an inch behind the forend tip. The pattern will be about six and a half inches long. I'm laying the forend pattern out on paper first to make sure I'm happy with the design before I draw it on the stock. Since I'd like the pattern about six and a half inches long, I'll draw that line on my paper pattern. The margin on the forend should match the pistol grip, which is about 3 16 of an inch. I've made a mark down that far from the top edge of the stock. Then measured the distance between those marks, which is 4 and 1 8 inches. Next, I'll measure around the stock at the front edge of the pattern, which is 3 and 3 16 inches, and draw in both of those lines. Connecting the corners gives me the outside shape of the forend pattern. The first master line will intersect the front upper corner of the pattern. This checkering pattern will have diamonds that are three times as long as they are wide, so I'll use the three to one diamond to lay out the master lines. These lines help keep additional lines perfectly straight and determine the shape and position of the diamonds. The rest of the points are sketched in using the 3 to 1 diamond. I'm using the Winchester Supergrade to loosely base my pattern on. I'll have five points at the front and four at the rear. A nice point pattern. Now that I've drawn in all the points, I'll simply cut out the pattern and tape it to the forend. If I want to make any adjustments, I can do that now or make a new pattern if necessary. I'll shorten these points to make it a bit more attractive. This layout scribe will help to keep the top edge of the pattern perfectly parallel with the top edge of the forend. Then I'll lightly draw along the points of the pattern and the master lines. After all the lines have been lightly marked, I'll scribe in the master lines. A stiff piece of strapping tape is used to lay them out. I'll then cut in both the master lines and the top border lines with a 60 degree cutter. The tool is set up to cut on the push stroke only. I use a series of short strokes to cut almost the entire length of the lines. As this is a point pattern, the remaining points will be determined as I cut the additional lines. After the master lines have been laid out, I can begin cutting all the crossing lines of the checkering pattern. I'll begin by making a series of progress marks that will help to keep the lines straight and parallel. The checkering lines are laid out with a two line tool with a 20 line per inch spacing. Actually, I'm using two of them. One has an edge with no teeth on the left cutter, 
the other with no teeth on the right one. I'll use one or the other depending on whether I'm laying out my lines from left to right or right to left. The smooth cutter follows the master line without deepening it. I'll space out lines until I reach the first point in the pattern. I've left the last line just a bit short. This allows the point to match perfectly. I can always add an additional line if I want the point to extend a bit farther. As I continue to space out lines, the next point will be defined. Again, I'll stop short to ensure that my lines will match up. It's easy to see how the lines define the points of the pattern, which is why this is referred to as a point pattern. I've cut the lines as far as I can along this point. Since the next line extends all the way across the pattern, it has to be perfectly straight. To make sure of that, I'll scribe the next line using a straight edge and holding it along the last line I've just cut. then chase it out with the 60 degree cutter. It's then back to laying out lines using the spacing cutter. Even though the lines are completely laid out in one direction, none of the points are formed. I'll chase out the master line with the 60 degree cutter and then begin to cut in the crossing lines. I'll continue to lay out lines until I get to the first point. To define the point, I'll extend one of the lines along the point, then one along the other side. Now the point is defined, and I'll carefully scribe in the lines I've just drawn, then chase them out with the 60 degree cutter. Again, the angle of light is very important to see the work. After the lines are chased out, I'll use the spacing cutter to complete the point. You can see that the actual point ended up just slightly over from the marked line. As the crossing lines are laid out, the points are identified. There are two points that are a bit short. Not a problem. I'll simply stretch the points by extending each by a line to lengthen them. Then each line is extended to finish the point. The hook and pull technique works well for extending these lines. I'll continue to lay out lines along the pattern until all the points are formed. Again, special care must be taken in the corners to stay inside the border. An X-Acto knife can be used for the last of the lines. Once all the lines are laid out, I'll deepen the border slightly with the 60 degree cutter. This extra depth will let the cutter run up to the border line and bump it, reducing the chance for runover. With the border deepened, I can begin the first deepening with the 60 degree cutter. This first pass is fairly light, making it easier to follow the grooves, then follow it up with a heavier pass to deepen the line. A short 60 degree cutter is used for the short lines in the corners. The lines that can't be reached with the short cutter are deepened with the veiner. I'll rotate the stock and finish the crossing lines in the corner of the pattern. You can see that I'm using the border line to stop the cutter. The process is exactly the same for the first deepening on the crossing lines. A light pass in each line with the 60 degree cutter, followed by a heavier pass. You can see how much wood is removed on the heavier pass. The first deepening is complete except for these six lines. 
I've used some tape to show which lines are left. Again, it's two passes in each line, a light pass followed by a more aggressive one. The second deepening is done with the 90 degree cutter. The steeper angle of the 90 degree cutter cuts wider grooves and begins to point up the diamonds. Again, it's two passes in each line, a light one followed by a heavier one. The difference between the 60 and 90 degree cutters is clearly visible. Now, the crossing lines are deepened the first time with the 90 degree cutter. This pass nearly completely forms the diamonds. It's very important to keep the tool perpendicular to the surface to keep the lines consistent. Again, I pay close attention in the corners as the short lines can be the most challenging. The very last pass through the crossing lines is extremely light. Its only purpose is to even out the last deepening so it's not apparent which lines were deepened last. With the diamonds complete, I'll begin the border by deepening the border lines with a 60 degree cutter. The border tool cuts an outside line and forms a radius on the area between the two lines, removing small nicks and runovers. The border is deepened until all the finish is cut away and the nicks are smoothed out. The lines have to be extended past the point with a 60 degree cutter until they meet. A pocket knife can be used to match up the contour. Once all the outside points are complete, the process is repeated for the inside corners. After the borders are completed, the checkering is cleaned out with a nylon brush. And sealer is brushed into the checkering to seal the wood.